Okay, uh, some of the named fractures. This is a Montasia fracture, also known as the nightstick fracture. Uh, because when you go to whack someone on the head with a nightstick, they will typically raise their arm like this and present you with their ulna. So that's how you can always remember it's an ulna fracture that is associated with radial head dislocation. And that brings up the other rule of uh, elbow radiography, which is uh, that the radial head should always be perfectly aligned with the capitellum on every view. It's one of the few things that doesn't change with the obliquity or the direction of the view. Frontals, laterals, obliques, whatever it might be, the radial head should sit and appear perfectly articulated with the capitellum. So obviously not the case here, right? It's shifted superiorly uh, relative to the capitellum, and here it is shifted laterally, right? So that's a classic combination, ulnar fracture, with a radial head dislocation is a Montasia fracture. Again, a nightstick fracture always helped me remember that. Okay, a couple of kind of obscure fractures. These are not very common, uh, but this is a capitellar fracture. Okay, I don't see a proper underside of the capitellum here. And what has happened is it is fractured and rotated superiorly right there. So that's the cortex of the capitellum, which should be right along here, right? And you can see it here, it's actually superimposed over the distal humerus. These can be pretty tough to sort out, but having seen this now, you know, uh, capitellar fractures will displace like this. And I've got another one that goes out a little laterally. So this didn't shift as straight in the uh, frontal view as the previous one. It's rotated out a little bit. And so that's that added density that you can see right here. There's probably more of the articular cortex gone because you can't see a proper rounded capitellum down here articulating with the uh, radial head. And here it is on the lateral. And you can see a nice big elbow effusion, right? These can be subtle, but that's a sales sign. And there's probably a posterior fat pad as well. So capitellar fracture. All that is circular is not necessarily a capitellar fracture though. And you can see this is actually what's missing, the radial head. Right, the radial head is gone. It's just sheared right through. There's a fragment here as well. Right, and it is uh, rotated and anteriorly displaced uh, quite dramatically there. And so this is probably this displaced fragment. And it just shows you uh, what a fooler that frontal view can be, right? Or any view for that matter, right? But you can see in this case, the frontal view makes it look like this is still sitting on top of the radial head, but you can picture the beam is coming right through like this. And so uh, that dramatic anterior displacement is just not apparent on the frontal. All right, and our last elbow fracture is a coronoid process fracture. And the thing to note about this is you need an oblique. So if you see an elbow effusion and you're not, uh, you're not spotting anything and the mechanism is not good for radial head fracture, meaning it's usually a foosh, right? Fall on outstretched hand uh, that causes a radial head fracture. So if you have any reason to suspect anything else, Get an oblique. Now, these are part of a lot of routine elbow radiographs, but not always. And just know you're never going to see a coronoid process fracture on a straight lateral or, of course, on a frontal either. You really need obliques to, to definitively diagnose these. All right, I put this in because it's so odd. They're not just for children anymore. This is a medial epicondylar avulsion. And that is typically a childhood injury, right? When that is still yet to fuse 
right? The growth plate there. And so this is a, a more common injury in children. It's in fact, might be the only one I've ever seen in an adult, pretty unusual. And you wonder if it was just uh, incompletely fused to begin with. Okay, so now we're moving down to hand and wrist. And this is another named fracture. This is the opposite right, of the Montasia fracture. So we had Montasia fracture, which is an ulnar fracture with radial head dislocation. This one is a Galeazzi fracture, which is a fracture of the radius and a dislocation of the distal ulna. So on the frontal, you would say, ah, that's just a radius fracture, right? But it's actually visible. This is too wide. The radio ulnar, the distal radio ulnar joint is just too wide here, right? And you can then go to the lateral and see it's completely displaced but it's just been almost straight posterior, so it's hard to appreciate on the frontal. But that relationship uh, should be striking you as abnormal as well. Uh, I'm looking at, is there a wrist effusion? Maybe not. You, for wrist effusions, what you wanna do is look at the anterior aspect of the distal radius. Uh, the pronator quadratus muscle lies there, and so you'll usually see a relatively thin soft tissue shadow that you can pick out right in this region, and it's really indistinct in this case. Sometimes you'll see it truly bulging out, and that's how you call a wrist diffusion on a lateral radiograph. Okay, some scaphoid fractures. And with scaphoid fractures, what they typically, if there's sufficient uh, suspicion, they'll get a navicular view, right? And the old name for the scaphoid was the navicular, but then that caused confusion with the navicular of the foot. So they changed this to the scaphoid. Uh, but in some of the old texts, you'll still see uh, reference to the navicular of the wrist. And they still, in my day, even called these navicular views, where you rotate the hand, uh, ulnar deviation, basically, and it lays out the scaphoid much more uh, easily to uh, identify these, uh, these fractures. But there is the fracture lucency right through there. They can be extremely subtle. So look at the scaphoid uh, very, very carefully in every trauma wrist. Here's another one I'm going right through the waist. They're not all through the waist, but this is undoubtedly the most common place, right? You can get them of the scaphoid tubercle distally, and I've even seen a few uh, probably related to scapholunate ligament uh, traction. But the waist is probably the most common place you'll see it. Okay, the classic complication of a scapholunate fracture is this guy. You can see that fracture very nicely, partly because it's outlined by the sclerosis of the proximal pole of the scaphoid. Can you all appreciate that? Let your eyes glaze a little bit and appreciate the diffuse increase in density in that proximal pole. Uh, this is the early manifestation of preser osteonecrosis where basically the, uh, the blood supply, there's a branch of the radial artery that comes off and enters the distal aspect of the scaphoid and supplies the scaphoid bone from distal to proximal. So when you crack it through the waist, the proximal pole becomes ischemic. And so the body responds with sclerosis and ultimately uh, fragmentation and collapse. So this is uh, essentially the same thing as uh, Kienbach osteomalacia, where there's a vascular disruption followed by sclerosis, fragmentation, and collapse. It's just involving the proximal pole. And by the way, for the first years, I've probably told everybody else this, but don't put an apostrophe S on eponyms. It is not the personal possession of Dr. Preser, this osteonecrosis, right? It's Preser osteonecrosis. Uh, it's not, uh, and I always remember my attending told me that because I had a, a slide up of Trousseau's syndrome. And he said, you know, that's grammatically incorrect. You don't put apostrophe S uh, because it's not that person's possession. 
And I said, well, actually, Dr. Trousseau uh, is the one that described Trousseau's syndrome, the Trousseau's triad, and later died of it. So he actually was personally in possession of Trousseau's syndrome. So in this one case, it's probably accurate. He didn't, uh, he didn't uh, agree to my reasoning, but all right. Uh, this is another great kind of classic complication. You can see there's been a distal radius fracture and it's not acute, right? You can see that some healing and remodeling has gone on. There's sclerosis across here. You probably got some chronic uh, periosteal new bone formation on the uh, outer aspects here of the distal radius. But what there also is, is widening of the scapholunate joint space. And I will tell you, this is obvious. If you're looking at this and going, what the hell is he talking about, right? There it is. It is far too wide. The intercarpal joint spaces should all be identical, right? They should all be the same width. And there's a nice internal comparison for you on every wrist film, and this is too wide. Uh, and I will tell you, the scapholunate ligament ruptures can be very subtle, a lot more subtle than this one. Okay, so this is a blatant example of scapholunate ligament rupture, and they're frequently associated with distal radius fractures. There it is. Nice view of that healing distal radius fracture as well. All right. Uh, we'll do one more. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of thinking on this one. Uh, this one kind of goes with the next one. But we'll do this one, and then we'll do, redo it next time. Okay, so uh, when you look at this frontal, you actually can spot this abnormality on the frontals. Uh, it's, it's difficult until you know the trick, which is look at the lunate. The lunate looks triangular. See how it's got a point like that? And that is a clear sign of lunate dislocation. When the lunate dislocates, it rotates 90 degrees and it pops anteriorly. And that's what makes it take on this bizarre triangular appearance. Right? It, it's subtle, but as soon as you specifically go to pick out the lunate, you can see that it's clearly abnormal. Right? And here it is right here. Look at that, that moon, that half moon shape of the lunate clearly rotated 90 degrees and anteriorly displaced. It's just popped completely out of that proximal carpal row. And uh, importantly as well, you can see that all the remaining carpal bones maintain their relationship with the distal radius, right? The capitate, head of the capitate, usually is right in line with the distal radius and the base of the scaphoid right here. So you can see those are still lining up with the radius. And that's the important distinction to make because, well, I'm going to show you the other one too. Okay, there it is on the frontal. Triangular lunate, right? And clearly displaced lunate on the lateral. But now let's go to the other dislocation. This is a perilunate dislocation. So in a perilunate dislocation, the lunate maintains its relationship with the distal radius and the entire carpus is dislocated and posteriorly displaced. Okay, so when the lunate dislocates, it pops forward and rotates. When the carpus dislocates and you get a perilunate dislocation, it leaves the lunate behind and it all shifts posteriorly. Okay, so in this case, You've just got a jumble here. This is usually what it looks like on the frontal, where you just can't pick out the proximal carpal row uh, with any accuracy, right? With any uh, certainty. And then on the lateral, there's the distal radius, and it's maintaining its relationship with the lunate. But the capitate head, the base of the scaphoid, they're all shifted posteriorly and no longer in line with that distal radius. Okay, so that's how you can tell the difference between a lunate dislocation and a perilunate dislocation. One other thing to throw in about the perilunate dislocation is it is frequently associated with scaphoid fractures. So sometimes it'll leave a little bit of scaphoid behind, 
Other times the scaphoid just uh, fractures in half and the whole thing still moves posteriorly. And I rather suspect that's what we've got here, right? The, we don't see a proper scaphoid here. And in fact, it looks like it's torn through right there. So that's an additional thing. When you see that disordered proximal carpal row, immediately go and say to yourself on the lateral, does the lunate line up with the distal radius or does the main carpus line up with the distal radius? That lets you distinguish between lunate and perilunate. And once you've determined it's a perilunate, go look and see if you can see an intact scaphoid because that's, that's what's known as a perilunate transscaphoid uh, fracture dislocation. I think I've got a really obvious transcaphoid. Ah, I didn't include it. Sorry, you guys. All right, so we'll go ahead and stop there and we'll pick up with these. I wanted to mention to you guys beforehand, it's very important that you master the fracture. Uh, we do incredible QA surveillance at VRAD and we process all of our uh, errors. We categorize them all by modality, by specific pathology, by anatomy. And I can tell you the most commonly missed entity, pathologic entity across all modalities, across all body parts, et cetera, is the fracture. And uh, when it comes to fracture radiographs, for that matter, the most commonly missed fractures are hand and wrist. And so as a class, the fra if you just learn to identify all the fractures that come your way, you will markedly improve your accuracy rates uh, just because of the frequency with which we see these and with which radiologists miss them. So I should have given that as an inspirational message at the beginning rather than at the end.